So now I'll hand over to Anna. Thank you, Emma. Um, yes, as Emma said, my name is Anna Ankutsi, and I'm going to be doing a talk today on endometriosis and sex, um, predominantly from a pelvic health physiotherapy perspective. Um, Emma's quite nicely done a little bit of an intro for me in terms of about me. Um, I'll just quickly summarise, but yeah, I, I'm a highly specialist pelvic health physiotherapist um, working at the Royal Free Hospital um, NHS London Trust in Hampstead. Um, I've been a physiotherapist for eight years um, and have specialised in pelvic health for the last uh, four to five years. Um, and then, yeah, there's the other little bits on the side that I, that I do. I like to promote the role of physiotherapy for um, young students who might be considering the profession. So um, I do a bit of work in that as well. But let's go on to talk a little bit about pelvic health physiotherapy. So some of you probably have seen a couple of the other webinars that have been done. So um, I've done one myself, but then also um, a colleague of mine, Hannah Beach, has done a couple as well over the past few years, um, covering quite a few different topics. Um, there was a COVID, um, sex and COVID uh, webinar that Hannah did a little while back. Um, and she's also covered uh, bladder issues as well. But, um, and I did one on pelvic pain. So um, in terms of pelvic health physiotherapists themselves, what do we treat? So we provide conservative treatment for bladder, bowel, pelvic pain symptoms, including sexual pain, which is what we'll be focusing on a little bit more today. So in terms of the bladder and bowel symptoms, just in, in case you would like to know and have treatment for that as well, but we deal with incontinence, um, whether that is bladder or bowels, um, frequency, so going really often, urgency so that feeling of needing to go quite like severely and quite urgently um not feeling fully empty um pain on um passing urine or passing stool and also prolapse symptoms as well and i know we had a few questions in um before the webinar which i was able to have a look through and um some of the questions were about referrals so there are free there's free access to pelvic health physiotherapy through the nhs and the best way to be able to see one of us would be to have a referral either through your GP. So your GP can refer you to your local service um, and a hospital consultant. So for instance, if you are under a gynecologist for your endometriosis, then actually they should be able to refer you directly to your local pelvic health physio service. Um, you might have to, you might have to mention it to them. Um, but the other option is also private. So um, there are quite a lot of private um, pelvic health physiotherapists across the country. Um, the best way to find one locally would be to, um, if you looked at the POGP pelvic health physiotherapy uh, website, they have a find my therapist option. So you can look in there, type in your location and it'll show you all the private um, pelvic health physiotherapists that, um, that are around. So that's, that's that. And Emma also quite nicely mentioned about um, the Q&A at the end and um, having a look at some of the questions beforehand, there were quite a few specific questions about applications of, um, of endo and um, maybe slightly more individualised like treatment. So I'm hoping that what I'm going to go through will, will be really useful for, for everybody. And in fact, I know that it will be, but I think I would always recommend making sure that you come and see or be referred to a pelvic health physio so that you can be um, reviewed individually and have your exercises tailored specifically for you. Okay. So the body's sexual response, so the systems that are at play. So these are all the systems that need to kind of be functioning together in order for us to want to be able to, um, to have sex. So that is our, our hormones, um, uh, the vasculature, so that's our blood flow, flow around the body, our nervous system, the muscles need to be also, um, also in play as well, and also our immune system. So actually, if there is a dysfunction or um, one of these isn't, isn't functioning in the way that we want them to, then actually sexual dysfunction can occur. So what is sexual dysfunction? So that is deemed as any problem that prevent sexual um, pleasure, sorry, during the sexual response cycle, which includes four parts. So the first part is desire. So that's often what people describe as libido. So that, that desire and that want to engage in sexual activity. The next phase is arousal. So that's the excitement that when, when you're engaging in sexual activity, noticing changes in the body, which 
make you want to engage in it further and continue in the act. Um, next stage is orgasm. So that is the phase is um, phase of climax um, and then resolution. So that is post climax and just like, I guess, recovering post um, post sexual activity. So sexual dysfunction can happen at any of these of these four parts. But let's talk a little bit about types of sexual dysfunction. So you can have anorgasmia. So that is um, the inability to um, orgasm or even like a general orgasmic, orgasmic disorder. Um, hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So that is um, a low libido or a lack of sexual desire. Um, sexual arousal disorder. So that's a difficulty in becoming aroused. And then dyspareunia, so um, pain during sex. So I've highlighted that because that is predominantly what we're going to be um, looking at and focusing on today. So what are the typical causes or the usual causes of sexual function, sexual dysfunction? So I've kind of broken it down into three categories. So you have like the biological factors, the psychological factors, and then the relational and social factors. So if we start with the um, biological, so we know that hormone um, imbalances can, can cause um, sexual dysfunction. So that might be because of vaginal dryness, um, it might be because of something called vaginal atrophy, where there's like a, a lack of, of plumpness to the vaginal wall and the muscles. Um, so that can make sex painful. Um, we know that low estrogen levels as well can sometimes reduce the feeling and the sensation in the genitals and things such as menopause, um, pregnancy and also surgery can also affect the hormone levels as well. Um, and I guess, understandably, gynecological conditions as well can also be some causes for sexual dysfunction. So um, endometriosis, um, fibroids, um, cysts, those are things that can all um, unfortunately cause pain during sex. So certain medications. So um, there is known to have antidepressants that can, um, can reduce your sex drive and your libido and sometimes affect your ability to orgasm. Um, and chemotherapy as well, cancer treatments can also affect hormone levels and, um, and cause reduced libido as well. Um, blood flow disorders, so I won't touch too much on that, but blood flow disorders as well, as I said, kind of need good blood flow to the genitals in order to be able to stimulate um, arousal and, and also achieve orgasm. Um, particular health conditions, so this might be diabetes, arthritis, um, neurological conditions such as MS, heart disease, um, and we know that drug addiction and alcohol can also um, inhibit um, sexual experience as well. So looking at the psychological aspects, so depression, so that could be more um, like a lack of interest in wanting to engage in things that you wanted to do before, you'd like to do before, and that could include sex. We know that stress and anxiety play a huge role in our ability to um, become aroused or want to engage in sexual activity. So this might be stress at home, it might be at work, um, and that can actually sometimes just make it quite difficult and hard to even focus on wanting to engage in sex. Um, and then this might lower the sex lower your sex drive. Um, I think past physical and sexual abuse, um, I think quite understandably, um, th this can affect your um, ability of, um, of, of trust or even just maybe even um, just wanting to engage in, in relationships with people. Um, and self-esteem is a huge thing as well. Like low self-esteem and that kind of feeling of hopelessness um, can also contribute to Relational and social. So conflicts within the home, so there might be um, um, family issues, uh, financial problems can put strain on relationships and um, that overall strain can cause um, a lack of wanting to engage in sexual activity. Um, cultural beliefs, so um, different culturing beliefs and cultural beliefs can um, affect the way that we look and, and approach sex, whether it's in a, a way that should be um, I guess in, enjoyed or is it more so from a recre um, recreational perspective? Um, and then also it's not just um, yourself thinking about your own sexual dysfunction, but quite often sometimes as well, we have patients whose partners also have some form of sexual dysfunction and that could be um, causing um, potential issues in the relationship as a whole. So why are we talking about this today? So, so sexual pain, 
is the third most prominent symptom and complaint for people with endometriosis. Um, and it actually affects two thirds of people who are diagnosed with endometriosis. And I think one of the things that I'm hoping to get across a little bit more in terms of this presentation is to kind of steer away from the things that maybe we can't necessarily control and thinking about the things that we can. So I've put at the, at the bottom that endometriosis alone isn't the only possible cause for uh, penetrative pain and sexual pain. So for instance, you can have deep penetrative pain or you can have vaginal entry pain. And what you'll kind of come when we, when we go through the rest of the slides is that actually potentially the symptoms could be more related to a, a muscular dysfunction that's developed over time. Um, and actually that muscular dysfunction is what we're looking to treat. It's not just that, there could be, as I said, like psychological factors as well that also need to be addressed. But going back to kind of the, the, um, the muscular aspect, um, we know that penetration can like pull um, and stretch or be irritated in inflamed tissue, which can cause that pain. But what we're looking to do is try and correct like the movement, that coordination and the strength of the muscles, which can hopefully help to improve pain symptoms. But it can also help with other symptoms, such as like the bladder and bowel symptoms that we were talking about at the start as well. So what I think is also really important and what I try and, and do a lot with my patients is just having a bit of an understanding of pain. And this isn't something that can, um, it's not something that people can always get straight away. I think sometimes I find it quite difficult to, um, to relay to people or, or help them to understand because it is extremely complex. And I think one of the key things is just remembering that pain and tissue damage isn't always equal. So one doesn't always equal the other. And that effectively, when we're looking at what it calls like more chronic pain, so pain that's lasting and a bit more, more persistent than three months, actually there could be an increase in the nerve sensitivity, but also an increase in um, muscle tone. And tone is just like the, the resting state of these muscles. But just going back to like the nerve sensitivity. So if an area, nerves supply our whole body, but if in a particular area is getting um, is experiencing a lot of discomfort and pain. So these nerves in particular are getting like activated really frequently. Then the brain kind of decides that we need to become more sensitive. So we need to detect these um, potential threats because we want to try and protect our body better. But what then can happen is that the nerve system can adapt um, and, and amplify, which then means that they are on, um, on high alert which then effectively means things that shouldn't be as painful as they would have been normally can now be really painful. So things that shouldn't be um, too uncomfortable like speculum examinations, inserting a tampon, um, having, having sex is now really uncomfortable. Um, and actually that increased nerve sensitivity can outlast the, the physical symptoms. Um, so I guess one of the questions and things was about um, laparoscopies and, um, whether like sexual pain can um, can be completely eliminated from that, it's really difficult to tell because it's it's it can. But then also, if there is a muscular aspect or a nerve sensitivity aspect, even though um, post surgery, there could still be elements of that that need to be worked out. And we know that our psychological state can also affect this um, hugely, and um, that's our body reacting in a fight or flight response. So. We're going to talk about it in a second about the pain cycle but effectively our body is trying to protect us but it's protecting us a little bit too much so let's have a little look at the the pain cycle in in relation to um painful sex so to start off with we anticipate pain so there is that fear and that anxiety that i was talking about initially um, which then leads to potential involuntary reactions so our pelvic floor muscles which we'll go into a little bit um, later on so they they'll tighten and as it says it's involuntary so this isn't always something that you can control um, but what that does then lead to is having painful sex so that would then lead to difficulty with penetration which is reinforcing our initial fears of the fact that we think it's going to be painful so then that pain is reinforced at that point so we naturally then will start to respond by bracing so that might be um, tensing or just or wincing or anticipating that it's gonna, gonna hurt and tensing our pelvic floor. Um, and because that cycle kind of repeats, it leads to avoidance. 
So that is um, avoidance of intimacy and reduced desire. Quite often I'll have patients who say that they don't necessarily, again, we're going to go into it a little bit in the next slide, but they won't necessarily engage in the sexual activity that they enjoy because they are so concerned and worried about what potentially could be happening coming next. So the fact that it could be they're enjoying the, um, the foreplay, but actually they know penetration is coming soon. So they can't really enjoy it to the way the degree that they would want to. And I think that's why I put in this corner, don't forget there's also changes in arousal. Um, also in terms of lubrication, we need we need all of these, we need to feel safe and we need to have that environment to be able to produce that lubrication that will make sex a bit easier. Um, and also just a bit of a reduced trust and confidence in our own body. Why is why is it this happening? Why is it always painful? If it's gonna be painful, is it like blaming themselves? So um, again, we're gonna to touch on that a little bit, but how we feel about ourselves and how we look at ourselves is, is hugely, hugely important. Okay, so the psychological, relational, relational and social factors. So I've got here like the parts you can't ignore and it, it really, really is. I think if the, this side of things isn't necessarily addressed, we can, we can tackle all the physical symptoms, but if this side isn't addressed, then actually it's gonna be really difficult to see um, improvements in, in symptoms as, um, as a whole. So what I've kind of put here, and this is just a hand, full of quotes from, um, or things that I typically tend to hear in clinic quite often. So um, I feel broken or that part of me is broken. There's like a huge dissociation with their, with that, that area as a whole, the pelvis, genital area, um, just wanting to kind of either forget that it's there or everything that they associate with it is potentially a bit more on the negative side because they just, all they associate is pain. Um, which leads on to the next one, I just put up with the pain, um, which is quite often said, just like, I just do it. But no one under any circumstance should be engaging in sexual activity. Um, that's painful if they, and they don't want to, that, that shouldn't be happening. Um, I'm afraid that they'll leave me. So this is more in relation to their partners, maybe not having open conversations with them about how they're feeling and um, how this is affecting them and just putting up with things because they think actually, it's better than them leaving me. Um, stress, we talked about. Um, stress is just something I'm just used to now. Um, a lot of my patients struggle with, um, I guess, finding time um, for themselves. So there's always lots going on. There's gonna be work stress, there's gonna be general life stress, um, and prioritizing self-care is sometimes put really down at the bottom of the list, but I can't express to you how important it is. Um, and I feel anxious all the time. Um, so anxiety is a, is a huge thing. And then how will I explain this to a new partner? So trying to navigate the fact that you've been having um, painful sex for a considerable amount of time and trying to navigate new relationships, um, which is difficult. And I think um, it's really important to kind of address these fears and, um, and try and find res resources or ways to be able to cope with that. So I will always recommend if you haven't already, like going through some kind of counselling. So whether that is um, psychosexual counselling, it could be family or relationship counselling, or it could be trauma-based counselling if it's more related to um, PTSD or um, previous um, sexual assault. So as I said, I think I can't ignore this bit. It's not the focus of what I'm talking about today, but um, it's, it's so important. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is actually what does sex mean to you? So everybody is different, but I think sometimes, again, quite often in my clinic, I'll get people with maybe slightly unrealistic expectations or unrealistic expectations of what I guess everybody else might be doing from a sexual activity perspective. So um, as you can see there, like the evidence shows that 70 to 80 percent of women will not orgasm with penetrative sex. So I think there is. Um, I sometimes say like sex is like a buffet there's there's lots of different things that you can you can do and that you can enjoy but some things are for some and some things aren't for others which is why you choose different things and penetration and also this is talking about penetration alone not necessarily with clitoral stimulation but I think it's really um, important to recognize that I always try and say that it's really important to know what you enjoy personally um, so that you can then feed that back to whoever you're with whoever you're engaging with so that they know because 
your enjoyment and pleasure is just as just as important as theirs actually sometimes I might say even more important just because you're having to navigate a long-term condition which comes with um, a lot of different factors and maybe needing a bit more reassurance and a bit more care and um, it's really important that you advocate for yourselves and in terms of the frequency so Brits on average are having sex about three to four times per month so again I don't know if that surprises anybody or if there is maybe slightly less than what people are thinking but maybe again also just not thinking that Basically, people are doing it, doing it all the time or having those unrealistic expectations. I think social media, um, um, TV and, and things like that haven't necessarily portrayed it in the best way, especially with the, with spontaneity in particular. Um, sometimes things need to be planned and that's OK. And sometimes you need to work on your breathing before engaging in sex. Again, that's absolutely fine. But I think it's just knowing what works for you. Um, and as I said, sex doesn't just mean sexual intercourse. That means it's sexual activity. So that could just be building up intimacy, could be could be kissing, could be hugging, could be just spending time together. That in itself can also be included into sexual activity. Okay. So done that, then we're going to go more on to specifically um, physio assessment. So I wanted to touch on a little bit about what you would potentially um, expect if you were to have a a physiotherapy appointment for for sexual pain so first we tend to ask a lot of questions having asking a lot of questions is really useful for us to get a feel for what's going on um, as a whole so we'll ask about the history of the condition so when did when did you first notice this pain um, how has it progressed over time was there any key instances that you can think of that might have um, might have contributed um, was it like better or worse post your laparoscopy if you have had one and um, all of those types of things will give us a good history and a timeline and the next is the location of pain so is the pain deeper so do you feel it deep and um, deep towards like the cervix or do you feel it right at the entrance is it both um, but again that gives us a bit of an indicator as to maybe what different structures might be at play description of pain so often um, people will describe the pain as like burning or maybe like an irritation sometimes sharp stabbing. Um, I have some patients that just describe it as a block. So it's just like, it, it's just, it doesn't feel like they can get past it. Um, or like an aching pain, which might potentially last uh, for longer than um, post-sex. Um, characteristics of pain. So that would be, is it only on touch? I have some patients that actually have discomfort and um, like vaginal pain on just sitting um, or potentially um, walking and things. Um, do you have, um, is it delayed? So actually it's fine at the start, but then gradually builds, or is it fine at the start and then gradually stops? And then for instance, how long does it tend to last for after, after having sex? Is it during orgasm? Um, all of these questions we will ask from a characteristics perspective. What things aggravate and then what things ease the pain? Are there certain positions that you've tried that definitely don't work? Are there positions that you've tried that feel a little bit better? Um, are you using things like lubricant, which we'll go on to in a second? Um, all those things are really important for us to know. Pattern, is it relate? Is it worse in the morning, worse in the evening? Is it worse at any particular time of the month? Um, is it in relation, worse in relation to your periods? Um, and then going on to like beliefs about sex. So that could be what your expectations are. How often is it that you're, you're feeling, or maybe you and your partner might be feeling about engaging in sexual activity? Um, as I said, are there any cultural factors that are at play? And also just wanted to know, like, is it, a, it from a police perspective, is it is this a priority right now? Because actually there might be quite a lot of other things that are um, at the forefront. And lubricant, are you using lubricant? Um, I've got a lot of um, people sometimes feeling a bit weird about using lubricant, but it's, it's an extremely useful tool, uh, whether it is for the exercises that we're going to be discussing or just in sex in general. Um, we tend to recommend water-based lubricant, um, but oil-based lubricants are also really, really nice if we're noticing any vaginal dryness. Um, but the just bear in mind that an oil-based lubricant can't use it with condoms because potentially could break down the silicone. Um, but you, lubricant is a really good tool. And the last thing I've put in like a big old orange box is um, goals. So what is it specifically that you are wanting to achieve? Because um, it might be different to what I was initially thinking, is it to be able to engage in foreplay more regularly? Is it actually to be able to have pain-free penetrative sex? Um, 
is it to be able to um, to orgasm without pain afterwards? All those different things. It's really important for us to know exactly what we're work, what we're working towards. Okay. In terms of physical assessment, so one of the, some of the things that we might have a look at. So one of them is your breathing, which might sound a bit strange, but um, if you've listened to any of our previous talks, um, your breathing is extremely in, important in helping from a pelvic floor relaxation point of view. And we'll go through that a bit more specifically in a couple of slides time. But we'd like to review that. We want to be able to coach and, and help guide you to maybe do it in the most effective way possible. And often we have with anxiety and stress, we notice that patients will tend to breathe up into their shoulders or up into their chest. Um, and not necessarily feeling that relaxed as a whole. And we also have a look at the abdominal muscles. So just looking for tenderness or any areas of, of pain or discomfort. We might do a pelvis and a lower back exam, um, assessment because all of those muscles surrounding your pelvis all filter into your pelvic floor. So they all work together. If there's tension building in the wider muscles, they can actually affect the pelvic floor which then can also lead to tension. But not only that, we know that with endometriosis, quite often you can have abdominal pain and general pelvis pain, um, whether it's like towards the lower back or towards your pubic bone or just in the abdomen, and which we know can carry tension and pain. So again, all of that filters in. So we'd need to do an assessment of that too. And then lastly would be a vaginal examination. Very much guided by, by you. I think I always say to patients that I want them to, to leave feeling that they want, want to achieve something, but never have just been pushed into too much discomfort or pain. So it might even be that in the first, first point, but we might not do an internal examination. It might just be observing from um, externally, but doing a vaginal examination really gives us a good indication as to what's happening with those muscles. What is the, what's happening with the nerve sensitivity is it a confidence or a dissociation issue? So maybe it might be all three, could be nerves, could be pelvic floor, could be um, muscular in general, or it could be confidence. And as, again, it just gives us an idea of what things we need to target and work on. So next, we've been doing a lot of talk about the pelvic floor. So let's have a little chat about them specifically. So our pelvic floor muscles are a group of muscles which attach at the front of your pubic bone and they go all the way underneath you and attach onto your tailbone. So the main roles of these muscles are to prevent any leaking of urine or any leaking of poop. Um, they support our pelvic organs. So if you look in that picture, it's supporting the bladder, the uterus and womb and the bowel. They are the muscles that give us feedback during sex. And they're also part of our core stability muscles as well. So how can these muscles influence pain during sex? Your pelvic floor muscles are emotional muscles. They very much respond and react to how, how we're feeling. So they can respond to stress, they can respond to anxiety, but also at the same time, they can respond to arousal um, and excitement. So the thing is with, um, with stress and anxiety and fear, that can cause, or pain, that can cause those muscles to tighten. And when those muscles tighten, then that increases pen uh, penetrative pain and discomfort. But sometimes people will think because it's tight, that must mean that they're strong, but that actually, it really isn't the case. Quite often the, the, the tension can still um, mean that the muscles are weak. And the way that we tend to describe that is like, imagine that you're trying to build up bicep strength and you, were, you would go the whole way through the range in order to build up strength. If the muscle is um, high tone, which is what we would say if, um, if we do an assessment and see that the pelvic floor is high tone, it's like working through half of that range or probably even less and then trying to strengthen through that. You can't build up strength unless you are able to fully release um, and then being able to work from that relaxed state up into a full contraction. Um, so one of the things that we're gonna focus on predominantly is gonna be our ability to be able to release and to relax these muscles. Okay, so we talked about breathing and um, I think I talked about this in my pelvic pain um, webinar as well. And the reason why it's so important is because our diaphragm and our pelvic floor muscles work really close together. If you can see in the picture that kind of as our diaphragm, um, so as we take a breath in and our diaphragm comes down, then our pelvic floor also does um, a similar thing. And then when we exhale, diaphragm comes up, pelvic floor comes up. So 
when I'm teaching people to do breathing, we're, we're looking at um, specifically diaphragmatic or abdominal breathing. So a nice way to practice that is if you were to put one hand on your chest and then one hand in your stomach. I know you can't necessarily see my hand, but um, what I'd be looking at is to take a breath in through the nose, encouraging the hand on your stomach to rise and fall rather than the hand on your chest. So what could be a quite nice way is to use counting. So maybe counting to four. So doing a breath in for four and then out for four, just really slowing down that breath, slowing down our breath helps with our nervous system, it calms it down. And also it's gonna to help to connect you a little bit more with that pelvic floor. We'll talk a bit about different tips for um, a little bit later, but it can help just doing a bit of visualization alongside doing your breathing exercises. But I would recommend it from a pelvic pain perspective in general, regular breathing practice is, is something that can be really beneficial. And the other thing I've put on here is mindfulness. So spending time being like, are you mindful or are you mindful? If you see in that picture, like, are we just full of everything that's going on um, in the day? Are we actually feeling quite present in what's happening in the moment? And it's really important from a sex perspective is if our mind's so busy and we're thinking about loads of different things, then one, we can't focus on, allow, on what we're doing and enjoying it in the moment. But also it's really difficult for us to think about how tense we are and can we relax and let go. So there's lots of different apps out there that can um, help to do daily um, mindfulness, or you might just be able to find some YouTube that, videos that work for yourself. Um, but I would highly recommend trying to make this regular practice. Okay, so we're looking at the pelvis as a whole. So as I said before, the pelvic floor muscles sit underneath your pelvis, and they're one of the key areas um, in terms of your pelvis as a whole but there's three other key muscle groups and these are your glutes. So they sit behind your pelvis. You've got your adductors, which are your inner thigh muscles, and then also your abdominal muscles. Um, and if, as I said, there's tension in, in one of these areas, then that can contribute to um, some pelvic floor um, dysfunction as well. So what can we do with these wider muscles? So anyone who's seen um, some of Hannah's other teachings, um, she talks about like the three, um, Hannah's key, three key tips. And they are, it's really simple, but um, they're really effective. So it's using heat, massage and stretching. So that would be using heat, massage and stretch for, the, for your glutes, for your inner thigh muscles and also your abdominals. And from a um, duration perspective, you're looking at when you're using your heat, so that could be a warm bath, it could be a, um, using a shower head um, directly onto say um, your lower back, your abdominals, inner thighs, wherever you feel that you, you need to. Um, could be a hot water bottle, making sure that it's wrapped and then just applying that heat, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with anyway. And then massage. So with our glutes, you can maybe either use, um, well, I mean, if you've got um, a partner that's willing to do, mass um, do massage, then that's, that's great, that's really useful. Or you can go somewhere for someone to do um, some massage and get them to focus on these areas. Or you can do it yourself, so using your hand or using like a, a fist onto your glutes or flat palm for your, um, for your abdominal muscles. And then also just like your thumb, which you can use for your inner, inner thighs. Some people use tennis balls. Um, so a tennis ball, so you can sit on it and then almost roll out some of the tension within your glutes. Um, foam rollers um, are, really useful cheap options for massage as well you can get into those inner thighs um onto your abdominals and also into your glutes again and you probably want to be doing this for about 10 minutes at a time in terms of stretching each stretch you would want to be able to hold for ideally 20 to 30 seconds and repeating each stretch um each stretch two to three times um I'm, on the next slide i'll show you some of the stretches um that we usually recommend but I would start all of this, I'd probably start with doing it daily and then gradually work your way down to about three times per week. And then you can go down to once per week as maintenance. Okay. So from a stretcher's perspective, um, these are typically some of the stretches that we would recommend. I haven't included them all, but these are the ones that target a bit more of the specific areas that I was talking about. So you've got your flat frog, you've got your relaxed frog, happy baby. Um, You've got your glute stretch, your um, child's pose. So any of you guys who are familiar with, um, with yoga and Pilates have probably done some of these stretches or have often done these stretches in these classes. Um, and in the middle, you've got your cobra stretch, which is a lovely stretch for your abdominal muscles. And um, I just put in the corner that this was from the pelvic pain 
Foundation um, Australia, they have this as an online resource for these stretches. So if you want to find them, that's a good, that's a good place to start. Okay, and next. So next, I'm just gonna talk about external massage. So external massage is, we don't normally, we don't recommend it for absolutely everybody. It depends on what stage people, people are at, but sometimes this is a really nice starting point. So we talk about it as like the start of desensitization. So trying to calm down that nervous system and getting your body used to touch. So what is it? So it's massage of the vulva and the surface level pelvic floor muscles. Um, and why do we do this? So it helps to reduce the sensitivity of the muscles in the skin. Um, it also helps to encourage relaxation, um, helps to increase circulation and blood flow. Um, and also one of the key things I think I use it for is just to help people to start getting a bit more familiar with their own anatomy again. It's quite, um, quite often people, as I said, dissociate. And I know a lot of my patients have never looked as down there, never looked in that area. Um, some may never have even like thought to like touch or, or look at all in that area, which is which is absolutely fine. But I think if we're looking um, at reducing fear um, to help with pain, it's really important that you can you can touch that area, feel comfortable, and understand your anatomy and and um, having confidence in that. So how? So I would recommend using either an emollient so an emollient is kind of um it's like a cream but slightly slightly thicker i mean you can use um a, a cream so sometimes we recommend like a cetraben or an epiderm but something that's a bit softer but a natural based lubricant as well so maybe um, coconut oil or olive oil is also useful so if you see in the pictures and the ten directions in which um like the lines are so you can go if Sure, you can kind of see me, but I would probably start with just doing all over the vulva. So you've got your product in your hand, just going all over the vulva. So kind of around that perineal area, up towards the um, um, the clitoris, and wider. So going into those wider muscles. If you can do just straight up and down movements, if that feels better. If you're just getting started, you can just apply gentle pressure and just start getting used to pressure to start off with. And then also you can do small circles, almost doing little um, circular movements around. So you're going kind of up and down all the way around and then also into those wider muscles because you'll be filtering into your inner thighs. Um, but that's also like a, just a, a nice way because often what I see in clinic is people's muscle, um, legs tend to tense. They don't want to grip on with their inner thighs. So just starting by doing a little bit of nice relaxing massage um, nothing threatening um, can be really useful. Okay, so um, I'm not sure. Well, you might have you might have already heard a bit about internal massage, but um, um and dilator therapy. But I'm hoping to go through it just a little bit more with you guys. So um, this is one of the tools, or one of the many tools, I guess, that we use to help with stretching those pelvic floor muscles. So this is a way to help condition your brain and the body for um, for insertion. So what can we use? You can use your finger, you can use what we call dilators, or you can use a vibrator or use a dildo. So I would say your finger is your most accessible tool and it also gives really good feedback. Um, for you to be able to feel exactly what the muscles are doing. So whether that is that they're feeling really tense and they haven't let go, or if there's a specific area that you're finding is a little bit tender or if it feels a bit firm. Um, your finger is also um, on, this, on the smaller side. So actually that can sometimes feel less intimidating um, in terms of instead of going through um, using something like a vibrator or a dildo. But all these other pictures that I put on are pictures of, um, of dilators, um, apart from the middle one and the pink one in the middle, which is, um, which is a form of vibrator. But actually with dilators, what they do is gradually they go up in size. So there's lots of different types of dilators. Um, you have ones that are more specifically, um, like they're more plastic. So um, those ones typically you can actually get on prescription on the NHS, um, but you can also buy it yourself. But then you've got silicone ones um, that tend to have a little bit more give. Um, and as you can see, there's lots of different shapes and sizes. So some of them have slightly tapered ends, some of them have round ends, um, some of them are, sh are straight, some of them are slightly curved. And I think 
I mostly put up all these different pictures because I think the most important thing is that you need to use something that looks um, not necessarily appealing. Actually, no, it can be something that looks appealing and not daunting. Um, and in terms of like using a vibrator or, or, or a dildo, I sometimes would recommend that for patients who are already having sex, but are just finding um, specific areas of, of, of discomfort. So they might find it easier to use, use that instead and they don't need the first three or four sizes of the, um, of the dilators. Um, so that might be a better option instead. Another thing is that some people prefer to think of the exercises as slightly more clinical. So actually using a more, um, using a slightly more like clinical set is fine. And then some people want the opposite. They want it to feel like what their, their goal is and it's gonna, about wanting to engage in sex. So they don't want it to be plastic and hard and firm. They're wanting something that has, that feels a little bit nicer. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots and lots of different, there's lots of different types, but the biggest thing I would say is doing what and using whatever feels most comfortable for you. Okay, in terms of using your dilators, this is um, this is a nice way to be able to think about it. So if you think of the vaginal entrance as a clock, and if you see in the image, you can see all the different, um, all the numbers. So kind of 12 o'clock is up towards the clitoris, and then you've got three and nine o'clock directly into your inner thighs, and then six o'clock down towards um, the back passage. And what we would be aiming for when you're doing using your dilators is actually to go within the four and five o'clock position and the seven to eight o'clock position. So into those bottom corners, or if you're thinking of a box, you're going into the bottom corners of that box. The reason why is because if you go up, you're gonna be hitting your urethra. It's not fun, that's quite uncomfortable. If you go straight down, it might feel okay, but if you've got any um, difficulties with bowel emptying or you haven't emptied your bowels, then actually that could be quite uncomfortable. So we want to be aiming into those slightly meatier, musclier parts to try and get that stretch and release. So whether it is that you're using your finger or your, or your dilator, you want to gradually in, in, insert, and then you're going to be going into those corners. So it might be that to start off with, you might just want to use your breathing techniques just to gradually allow your finger to insert or even then the dilator. But when you think it feel like you get to a space where you feel quite comfortable, then you want to be applying um, a tolerable amount of pressure into those corners. And then you can start with pressure. I'd always start with pressure. Allow that discomfort to settle down. Do your breathing exercises, do your visualization. Um, and then you can hold it, maybe hold it for about 45 seconds and then release. And then you wanna go back and do it again after a bit of a break. And you can repeat that a few times on each side. So that's where I would be starting off with when you're using the dilators. One of the biggest things that people tend to typically do wrong is that they will tilt the dilators. So they'll tilt the tip and just move it around. Whereas actually what you wanna be doing is keeping the dilator in a straight position when you're moving it, because that's how you're gonna get the most amount of stretch. When you feel comfortable with pressure, then you can start getting used to doing movement. So whether that is just moving within that bottom half of the clock, so you're doing almost like that U-shaped movement, and then also that in and out movement. Um, in and out will tend to be initially the, the, the most, because um, uh, it's, it's friction. I would recommend definitely um, starting off with pressure and U-shaped movements first and then progressing. But with all this, you would be using lubricant. Make sure that you use lubricant to do these exercises because it will make it a lot easier. Similar to the other exercises I said, the consistency is so important because that carryover and that confidence is, is so much better when you're doing it every day. So ideally you wanna start with every day and then gradually you wanna be weaning it down a bit more as well. Okay. So some just additional tips um, for successful, successful dilation. So use your abdominal breathing whilst you're doing your exercises. Really think about um, that breath into your stomach and watching, thinking about that pelvic floor coming down. Using a mirror, sometimes dispelling some, um, some myths about what's happening down there, just getting familiar with your anatomy, seeing what's happening when you're using the dilators can give you some confidence. Squeeze, um, release and stretch. So once you've got your finger inserted or um, the dilator, what you might want to try is actually squeezing around your finger um, or the dilator and then letting go and then applying a gentle stretch with your finger or your dilator. That just encourages a little bit of extra, um, extra stretch on the pelvic floor muscle. Distraction. So 
some of my patients quite work quite well with distracting themselves when they're doing the exercises they might be watching tv they might be listening to music um they might be um um, listening to a mindfulness app um they might be talking to, to their partner or anything that helps to um to kind of take their mind off what they're doing can sometimes really help with that initial discomfort and pain first lip breathing is a different breathing technique so it's kind of um where you've got your lips closer together so i sometimes tell my patients to breathe in and then imagine that they're letting all the air out of the balloon so just letting all of that air come out can feel like the whole body's deflating and then also the pelvic floor is too um low humming again might sound a bit silly but that consistent low hum so almost similar to like a again creates pressure within our um our abdominal abdominals which can help with that relaxation visualization our brain is so important with this and sometimes even just thinking about or visualizing um the, the pelvic floor releasing or pelvic floor dropping for some people they might think about a flower bud which is closed and then thinking about the flower bud opening or thinking about um, a small circle that's gradually getting bigger whatever works for you mentally i think visualizing it can just help make things a little bit easier and then last thing i've put on here is make it less clinical so actually taking it out of the context of, of physio exercises maybe start inc incorporating some self-touch maybe incorporating um, um, starting to incorporate a bit more from an arousal perspective that might just help to, to just help just to get the pelvic floor to relax and release a little bit more. So quite often we get people like how do I transition from um, from dilators to the to the next step um, and these are just a, a couple of things to think about so consider what you're using to dilate with. So whether you've started with your dilators or you're using your finger, maybe it is time to progress to using, um, uh, using vibrators or dildos. There are also things called realistic dildos as well. So that can make maybe help from a confidence perspective. Um, the other thing is switching up the positions when you're using your dilators. So instead of lying on, lying on your back and then using your dilators that way, maybe do it all four position, side lying, change it up. I think it's important to feel confident that you can do these exercises in any position. So that can help translate into, into sex itself. Partner work. So when you start feeling quite confident with using your dilators independently and doing your pelvic floor relaxation work, start to incorporate your partner. Um, this, do it in a controlled way so they can use the dilators um, or use the um, dildo on you. But I think it's more about relinqu relinquishing some control um, and that needs to be done gradually. I would maybe pop their, pop their hand over your hand as you're using the dilator. Those kind of things can just start to build up that confidence and trust. Next is just like, have you addressed all your fears and anxiety? So going back to what I was talking about at the start, have you um, addressed some of those fears? Um, because again, if, if we haven't, then that's going to play, that's going to play um, a big part into that transition. And have confidence in your body. So if you've been dilating successfully or even those small first steps, that you should have confidence that your body is able to do what you what you want it to. Um, and that can take some time, but I think that's also really important when you're thinking about going into that next um, that next stage. So lastly, I'm just going to talk quickly about orgasm pain because um, we had a couple of questions related to that in particular. And uh, this is the simplest way that I could I could try and explain it. It's probably a, there's a lot more behind it, but um, I'm hoping that this kind of resonates with people a little bit. So, your when we have an orgasm, our pelvic floor contracts, and basically the quality of our orgasm can be really influenced by what's happening with our pelvic floor function. So whether that is um, our pelvic floor flexibility, the strength of our pelvic floor, the coordination. So it's really important that we optimize our pelvic floor, the release work, the strength work, um, that should really, I think the relaxation in particular should help with um, orgasm pain, especially pain that lasts post having sex and post orgasm. The other thing I would think about, and most importantly, is just remember that your brain is your biggest sex organ and it's really important to use it. Sometimes people, um, say so like end up working really hard for an orgasm. So in terms of very physical, it's very physical and um, their muscles are really working hard, it's really tense. But actually, if from an arousal perspective and, and as I said, using our brain and, 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 and visualizing and thinking about things and feeling really in the moment, 
we might not need to work as hard physically on the muscles because it's all happening up here, which then means that the muscles won't have to tense as much to, in order to achieve orgasm. And then that lasting pain won't be as long, but use your relaxation techniques post orgasm as well. Use your breathing um, to try and calm that system down. So just in summary, um, painful sex is a common symptom for people with endo, but it doesn't have to be injured. injured. Um, main thing I wanted to take away as well is that the sexual pain can be more due to muscular dysfunction that has been developed over time rather than necessarily the endometriosis itself. Um, pain itself is complex and there's a lot of physical, emotional, social, and environmental factors. It's really important that you understand what sex means to you and what you enjoy. Um, both the physical and the emotional psychological aspects of sex need to be, sexual pain, sorry, need to be addressed. Breathing exercises, pelvic stretches, External internal massage are useful tools to help tackle sexual pain. But as I said, for individual guidance, um, for how to do these exercises successfully, um, please um, seek help and guidance from a pelvic health physiotherapist. So, thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Anna. So, um, so much information. You were talking for so long. I was like, oh, um, I sorry. <laughs> works. No, it was good because it's information that was needed. Um, I just felt sorry for you because you were on a roll, and I was just like, oh, I hope she gets time to like, you know, breathe. Breathe. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, thank you. And we've had um. So, as I said before, we've had questions that were sent in before, and then questions that have just come in the night. So, the first one um from the ones that have come in um before is so can endometriosis ruin sex in a relationship as um intimacy is compromised yeah i think um it's, it's a it's a tricky question but i guess i think en endometriosis itself as i said um isn't the the only cause for sexual pain and endometriosis um can cause like this the symptoms are pain so what we're going to be trying to address or what we want to try and address is is the symptoms and it's like why is that pain happening so we need to come get down to the grips of is it a muscular issue is it a sensitivity issue um but that in itself once the symptoms are treated that shouldn't affect sex and shouldn't affect intimacy but it's the symptoms that potentially might do so i can understand why um there is that that, in, that initial difficulty of trying to navigate that all but once the symptoms itself are um are managed that, sh that shouldn't but that's as i said the maybe the muscular dysfunction and also the psychological aspect once that's tackled then the endometriosis itself is a, is a long-term condition but the endometriosis endometriosis itself shouldn't affect sex and intimacy we need to just address the symptoms of of how that pain is caused thank you um, and one for one that's sent in on the night. Um, so you kind of touched on it uh, like throughout, but then also in the summary, but I think it's uh, important to um, bring this up. And I think I've just lost it. I don't know how, I don't know how. Um, Can you vaguely remember it? <laughs> um, I don't want to, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Do it just in, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so. So the one is called, oh, I can't find it. Okay, so this person, I think I can remember it. So this person um, doesn't have any kind of, kind of sexual desire um, yeah. and doesn't feel the need to, um, doesn't want to um, kind of uh, masturbate or have sex. Um, and they're wondering if, um, if they should be forcing it. Um, and this is something they should, should they be um, trying the exercises anyways? Um, but I'm so sorry to whoever um, put that question in. I'm trying to find it, but I think, I don't know if it's been removed, um, but okay. yes. No, it's fine. I, I kind of, I think I vaguely um, understand. So effectively not, not having any desire to engage in sexual activity, um, but should, should she be doing the exercises um, anyway? I think the, I, in, in short, yes. <laughs> I mean, as I said, from an arousal perspective and a libido point of view, that could be for many, many different reasons. Um, and I guess maybe trying to get down to the grips of why that is. Um, and also it depends on if it's a priority for you. Um, if trying to rebuild that, or, um, rebuild arousal and rebuild a libido is a priority, then 
yeah, I can't say alone doing these exercises will, will do that. I think there's a lot of kind of other psychological factors and start um, can be part of that. Is it re- is it stress levels? Is it because there's so much going on that you 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 just don't feel that need and that desire to want to do so? But the exercise in itself can help to at least give the confidence that when you do want to engage in it, you can, which in itself might be a trigger to be like, okay, actually, maybe I do want to start engaging it in it. It doesn't hurt as much anymore. Um, so that's I would say also these exercises are good for general pelvic pain anyway, and also from a pelvic floor dysfunction point of view. So say if you were having any bladder or bowel issues, optimizing your pelvic floor is only going to be good for for your condition as a whole. So it is worth doing these exercises. Great, thank you. And so would sex be less painful post laparoscopy? Okay, so yeah, I remember remember this question. And actually, I guess you, you might have maybe heard from within my talk is that we can't say for sure. I mean, it really just depends on what the reason is for your sexual pain. So it may not actually be related to adhesions and where the endometriosis is. It actually could be related to a dysfunction in your pelvic floor muscles. So for instance, if it's if you're getting like deeper penetrative sex and it's maybe towards the cervix and towards the uterus, then maybe actually having um, laparoscopic surgery might actually have quite a bit of impact. But say if it's vaginal entry pain, um, then actually then it might not necessarily have that much impact because the pelvic floor dysfunction itself hasn't been hasn't been addressed. So I think it's it's really dependent, but I would say on the whole, most of the patients that I tend to see um, with with endo and with sexual pain will have pelvic floor dysfunction. So it's 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 probably best to address it, irregardless. Yeah, thank you. And I'll make this um, the last question. So, is there physio and support available for people who also have adenomyosis too? Yeah, one hundred percent. Obviously, the, the the nature of the the nature of the conditions are slightly are different, but in terms of the pain aspect of it is, is the same. And the pelvic floor dysfunction that can come from it, again, is also the same. So again, I'm trying to get away slightly from the condition itself and more to what is happening in, in the body as a whole and, and how you can address it. But as I said at the start, ask your, 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 ask your GP, ask your gynecologist um, or a hospital consultant or you can see um, private physiotherapy input, but we can we can definitely and um, help and 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 treat patients with adenomyosis as well. Thank you so much, Anna. It's-